Let's take a look at frequency distributions. So this is a long document. It has uh, you know, three different sections in it. And uh, I wanted to give you some, some text to read about these things. I'm not gonna go and read all of this, but I'm gonna show you some of the common statistical graphs that we have and how to set them up. So uh, frequency, dis when you see the word distribution, it sounds like a complicated uh, term, but really it's a table. Uh, frequency distribution, maybe a frequency table. And it's a table that organizes our data. So when you take, uh, if you take the statistics class, the statistics is all about data. It's, it's about collecting data. Uh, once you collect the data and you got a bunch of numbers and you want to organize them somehow, and creating a table, a frequency distribution or a frequency table is one way that we can organize the data to do something with it. Then after we organize it, we want to present it in somehow. And usually we present it in statistics using a graph. And the graph that we're going to talk about today is a histogram. It's a bar graph. You've seen it before. Uh, but to actually get into the minutia and, and construct one by hand is a little more difficult than just interpreting one. So we're going to look at that. Now, there are two different kinds of um, frequency distributions. If you have a data set that looks like this, and okay, so what does this mean here? Uh, this was a random sample of 35 10 year old boys. And they measured the height and then remeasured the height until they reach 18. The age of maximum yearly growth for each subject as follows. So they take their height at age 10, they take the height of these same 35 boys at age 11, age 12, age 13, and just track it. And then they say, Okay, where, where was the growth spurt? Where did they grow the highest? And how old were they when they grew um, the largest number of inches? And here were the ages. You, know, you got some late bloomers who, who grow the most at, at a later age. Uh, this person here grew the most at age 10, had the growth spurt at age 10. Uh, and, and you can see some of the common numbers like 13s and 14s appear a lot. So it's probably right around 13 and 14 where where boys um, have their growth spurt. But what you see about these data values, what's important for us is that there's only a few data values that are being used. The data values from 10 to 18, that's it. And when you have something like this, we're gonna create our frequency table in a way different than if we had many more. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take the age of maximum growth and we're gonna create a table. Here are the ages, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. These are the ages of the boys. And these are the frequencies. These are the number of boys that had their, their growth spurt at that age. So for example, if you wanna go through this list and count up uh, the number of 12s, there's a 12, I'll circle them maybe. There's another one and another one and another one and another one. So there are five 12s in that list. So the frequency, another word for frequency is just the count. There are five, 12. So this is the age, this is the number of time that age occurs. Okay, um, let's do number seven. This is a random sample of 30 college students. Each student is asked how much time he or she spends on homework in the previous week. And here are the number of hours. What you might want to do is to go through the list uh, because when you're creating, you need to know the smallest data value and you need to know the largest data value. So look through the list and identify the, the smallest and the largest. The, lar the smallest one we call the minimum. I just abbreviate it min. Uh, what's the smallest number in that list? I don't see any single digit numbers. 15, anything less than 15? Oh, looks like 15. And what is the max? What's the largest number of hours anybody studied in the previous week? 24? Couple of them, anything larger than 24? Okay, 24. So when you're constructing your frequency distribution, it's looking for a table and you're gonna have in your table, the number of hours, and we'll call them study hours. And then over here is the frequency. Since we're graphing a frequency table, we should have the frequency as one of the columns. And then since the smallest value is 15 and the largest is 24, just list all of those numbers down here. 15, 15, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 
23 and 24. So down here at the bottom then, you can have a total. And they told us that there were 30 college students. So when you sum up all these frequencies here, you should get 30. And that's one way that you can, that you can check. All right. <laughs> I'm going to uh, go right to the graphing calculator here. You'll see the benefits of this uh, immediately. Um, usually what this would require you to do is to go through that list of 30 data values uh, about 10 times, counting the number of 15s and then counting the number of 16s and so on. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all of these data values here, and we're going to put them into one list. So go ahead and do that. It'll take you a couple seconds. So again, it's stat and then edit. Stat, stat key, and then edit, number one. Get you to your lists. You can clear those lists or just type over the data values. All right, so we're gonna put 30 data values in L1, and here they are. Very easy to make a mistake, particularly if you have numbers that contain decimals and, and you know might be rounded to the nearest hundredth and you have to type in a lot of stuff. But uh, this one's not so bad. Uh, one check that you can do is if you highlight the last data value there, for me it's a 15, down here it tells you the position of that data value. And if your last data value says it's in position 30, then that means you've got 30 data values typed in. And that's what you want. The other thing you, you should probably do is to somehow confirm that all of these are, are at least in the ballpark and you didn't make any errors. So for example, we know that there are no single digit numbers here. The lowest one is 15. All right, so I just made a copy of it here. Now what I'm gonna do so that these are easier to count is I'm gonna sort them. If I had all the 15s in order and followed by all the 16s, followed by all the 17s, then I could just scroll through the list and count them up for each one. And that's what I'm gonna do. So um, go back to your home screen or quit in other words. Here's the quit key. You ever want to go back to the home screen, second, and then mode, quit. All right, then we're going to go back to stat uh, in the edit menu. But you can see two and three are sort commands. Sort will sort a list in ascending order, sort A. And sort D will sort the list in descending order, from largest to smallest. So let's sort our list in ascending order, two. So I type this command onto the home screen, and then I have to tell it which list to sort. And that's all it requires. Tell me which list to sort. And the list that we're after, I typed all my data in L1. So remember from last time that L1, the variable, is right above the number one. So if you want to get L1, you have to hit the blue key and then the number one. So blue key, and then that gives you the shift icon there and then the number one. So if you give it the command sort L1 and hit enter, nothing exciting happens here, but it says, okay, done, I've done that. And when you want to see the sorted list, you then go back into the stat menu and you can see now they're all sorted. I put the original list in L2 and the sorted list in L1 so that you can see them. How did you copy it in the L2? Uh, okay, so to do that, just highlight a list name like this, and then down in the input row, uh, write down the name of the list you want to copy. So if I do second one, so that L1 appears down here, then what I'm telling the calculator is make L3 equal to L1. Now look what happens when I hit enter. It takes all of these values and dumps them in here. So if I wanted to use this list later on, I would have it. Uh, you type in sort and then L1, and then enter and you should see done. So every time you throw something on your home screen, your calculator doesn't do anything until you hit enter. Uh, if you delete a list or something, you can bring back that list uh, by going to the, the stat menu again. Um, and then there's this thing called setup editor. What it does is it brings back all the default lists, L1 through L6. If I go to my home screen and type in L1, it gives me a listing of all the numbers in L1 as a list, and I can just scroll through it and count them up right on my home screen. All of this, of course, just to go and, and count these up, but they're easier to count now because they're easier to count because they're all in order. So we can see there are, fifth, there are four 15s, 
So we'll put a frequency four there. And then you can come down and count the 16s. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so five sixteenths, and then one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Okay, so when I did that, this is what I have. And I really should go count these up to make sure that there are, in fact, 30 of them. 9, 15, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Yeah, so they all add up. <coughs> So when they say construct a frequency distribution, this is the answer. It's the whole table. It's really a construct a frequency table. And there it is. So your calculator can help you a little bit and you'll see even some more impressive stuff here coming up. Now that uh, frequency distribution was one we would use if you have a small number of possible data values. Here we have only about what, nine or 10, 10 different possible data values. If you look at this list here, uh, these are statistics test scores. So they should be something between 0 and 100. You got some A's and B's and D's and C's and so on. A lot of different scores in here. Now, when you have a, you know, we, we can't possibly list all the numbers from the smallest one somewhere in the 50s, no, somewhere in the 40s, maybe. Yeah, so it looks like you've got some scores in the 40s. And if you go all the way up into the high 90s, that's just too many data values. Your table will be just too long. So what we do instead is we create a smaller frequency distribution and we put a bunch of numbers together in a class. So we might do the uh, all the 40s in one class and all the 50s in another class and all the 60s in another class and so on. And this whole method of organizing the data this way is called a, a grouped frequency distribution because we're going to group a, a bunch of uh, data values together in, in what we call a class. When done, it's going to look like this. So you have the class going from 40s, from 40 to 49. There are three different test scores in that range. Then you've got the 50s, from 50 to 59. There's six test scores in that range, and so on, all the way through. You've got five scores that are in the 90 to 95 range. When you add up all of the frequencies, you get 40, and that's the number of students that took the test. When you um, the classes are here. These are just ranges of test scores. And if you count the rows, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. So we would say that there are six classes. They talk about lower class limit and upper class limit. Each class has a lower limit and an upper limit. So this 90 here is what we would call the lower class limit of the sixth class. And this 69 here, we would call the upper class limit of the, okay, one, two, third class. And then another important number is the class width. Now where we're going with this is we're gonna, we're gonna create a histogram. And we wanna make sure that all of our histogram bars are the same width. We don't want a skinny bar followed by a fat bar and, and, and so on. We want the class width to be uniformly the same. So if we choose the, the class limit to be, or the class width to be 10, then we want all of the bars to be, have a width of 10. Now, it's interesting how we do this. If the class width, uh, the way that we calculate the class width is you can see here, we subtract not 49 minus 40 to get nine, but rather we subtract the lower class limits of two consecutive classes. So what we're gonna do is take 50 minus 40 or 60 minus 50 or 70 minus 60 and so on. All of those will give you tens and you'll have the same class, class width. Okay, let's do, uh, let's do an example. See if you um, understand what we're doing here. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and and answer questions nine through 16 here. Uh, I'm assuming you have this in front of you. Uh, if not, it looks like you can see at least nine through 13 on, on the screen here. A college pre professor had students keep a diary of their social interactions for a week, excluding family and work situations. The number of social interactions of 10 minutes or longer over the week is shown and the following group frequency distribution. Okay, so the number of social interactions in a week, in a week, some said zero to four, 
12 students said that. Some students said that they had 45 to 49 of these social interactions, 10 minutes or long, more talking with anyone. Three students had that. Okay, so here is the frequency distribution. Frequency, you know, you could add all these up to find out the total number of students that participated. You could count the number of classes. You can answer questions about the upper class limit or the lower class limit. So let me just change this a little bit. Uh, identify the lower class limit for the seventh class. Identify the upper class limit for the third class. Okay, so in the chat, uh, write the number and then write your answer. So for this one, you'd write nine colon and then your answer, 10 colon and then your answer. 11 colon, what's the class width? All right, so let's do nine through 13. Put your answer in the chat. If there's one of these that you don't understand, like let's say you don't understand 11, then just say 11 colon and then question mark. Okay, so the, the class width, number 11. So they're referring to each individual class. How wide is it? So here's what you could do to, to see that. If uh, later on, we're gonna do a, a histogram and you start off with zero, and then the next bar begins at five, and then the next bar begins at 10, and then the next bar begins at 15. This distance here is known as the class width. And in any individual class, I mentioned over here that to determine the class width here, we're gonna take successive lower class limits and subtract them. 50 minus 40 would give you 10. So every one of these was a calculation of the class width. It's not the range of all the data, it's just the range of the data in one little class. Class width is five, here's the class width. From zero to five, five minus zero, 10 minus five, 15 minus 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, okay? like you understand what the uh, how many students were involved the total down here should be uh, 94 i see uh, any of you answered that one have that correct looks like 13 is 13 i'm not seeing any question marks next to any of these so it looks like um you're, you're picking it up you don't have questions but yet i'm not seeing many 13s for 13 there at least 30 okay so here's at least 30 so that would involve 30 or more, at least 30, 30 or more social interactions. So you have to count up all these frequencies. And when you count them all up, you get 13. So how many students had at least 30 social interactions? Yeah, 13, 14. How many students had at most? Okay, so at most means that's the maximum number that they had. So it would be 14 or fewer is what this means. <laughs> up here, this would be uh, the class from 10 to 14. We can't count any of these in the 15 class because these would be more than 14. So we want 14 or fewer. So we would add up those three. And I think we get 44 there at most 14. Okay, so let me maybe say a little bit more about 15. I don't see many answers there. Um, okay, so among the classes that had the greatest frequency. All right, so here's the frequency column. The greatest frequency would be 16. Okay, so now we're focusing in the rest of uh, what we read. We're going to be focused in on just those three classes. Of those three, those are the classes with the greatest frequency. Which of those three, which class, has the least number of social interactions? So here are 316. Here are the number of social interactions. So it looks like the least would be the five to nine range. Right? So above those three, what's the smallest number of social interactions? So it would be the five to nine range because it says which class. So uh, we either have to say the class five to nine or we have to say like the second class. So you might want to say the, the second class here. You have to describe it in somehow in some way. And in number 16, it says among the classes with the smallest frequency, the lowest frequency which class has the least number of social interactions. All right, so the class with the smallest frequency, if you look at all these frequencies, the smallest frequency is these last three. Of those, 
of those three classes, it says, it asks, which of those classes has the least number of social interactions? And again, the smallest would be the, the 35 to 39, or we could just say the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth class. Okay, so you were asked to interpret a frequency distribution. Early on, you were asked to construct a frequency distribution. And so this problem here is something similar, but instead of interpreting a table, you're asked to interpret a graph. You're gonna be asked the same kind of, same sorts of questions but the data are presented to you in a, not in a table this time, but in a graph. And if you wanted to, you could actually construct the table. So you would have your classes in the first column and then the frequencies in the next column. So if you can interpret, if you can answer these questions up here with a table, then if you're given a graph, you can convert the graph if you need to, to a table and then answer the same questions. So I would say 60. Now the next class begins at 70. So I'm gonna stop the first one at 69, begin the next class at 70. The frequency of the first class is two. That's what that number means. It also corresponds to the number over here on the, on the vertical scale where it says frequency. And these here are IQ scores now. In the class from 70 to 79, there are three. From 80 to 89, there are 13, and so on. And you can just go ahead and complete this entire table and have something similar to what you have uh, at, up above in that other example. Okay, um, let's take a look. Eventually, we're gonna be graphing these graphs right here today. And I'll show you how to do it with the graphing calculator as well. All right, now the number of uh, students that were sampled, we would have to, we would have to sum up all of these frequencies. We don't have them. We could just go along the bars and add them all up. Um, two plus three plus 13 plus 42 plus 58 and so on. And that would be the total number in A. Uh, the class width, okay, so the class width is right here. But remember that when we calculate the class width, we're gonna take these two numbers, 60 and 70 and subtract them, or 70 and 80 and subtract them. But we're going to subtract the lower limits of two consecutive classes. And this turns out to be uh, the class width is also the histogram bar width. So if you want to know what the width is, just come down here and, and ask yourself, well, how far is it from 90 to 100? How far is it from 70 to 80? Uh, in each case, the class width is going to be 10. All right, C says identify the classes and their frequencies. Well, we're not gonna do them all, but we did a few. We did the first three, and then we'd have to go down and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So there's, there are 10 classes. And so you'd have to have 10 rows in your frequency table here in order to see them all. The graphical representation is nice because you can answer questions like, which class has the highest frequency, the highest count? and that corresponds to the highest bar. So 58 is the highest frequency, um, but it asks what class has the highest frequency. So you wanna give the 100 to 109 answer. We don't, wanna, we don't wanna stop the class here at 80, even though that's what it looks like here from 70 to 80. We don't wanna go from 70 to 80 because the next class we're gonna begin from 80 to 90. And we don't want 80, the data value 80, to be able to be placed in two different classes. And that's what this caution is here. It says watch out for tables with classes that overlap, such as a first class of 20, 30, and a second class of 30, 40. What if we had the data value 30? Where would we count it? Would we count it in both classes? No, we probably shouldn't. The class that has the lowest frequency is this one way over here that has a frequency of one. So that's 150 to 159. Did any students have an IQ of 165? No, our highest IQ is up around 159 here. All right, I'm gonna wait to answer question F. We're gonna get into relative frequencies next. Okay, I think uh, online you're gonna have a little table you have to fill in here where 
Um, it's like this, it says the number of classes, A, that's not too bad, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have six classes. Yeah. Uh, but it also asks, what is the what are the class limits and the class width? All right, suppose we can do the class width again. Uh, all right, uh, let me ask you to do this. Go ahead and do the class width here. So the class width is four. We would take 10 minus 14, or 14 minus 10, or 22 minus 18, and subtract the lower lower class limits there. Uh, the class limits. So what they want is the lower class limit and the upper class limit. And I think they'll have a little box in each one of these cells of this table, and you'll be asked to insert the correct lower limit and upper limit. So for this one here, the lower limit, 13.9. And this book calls the upper limit 13.9. Other books will call it 14. 14 to 17.9, 18 to 21.9, and so on. So just identify the upper and the lower class limits. Here's the class. In this case, these are speeds. Now, eventually, we're going to get a, a, a raw data set like this, and we're going to um, establish the classes ourselves. And so usually, in our problems, they'll tell you, you know, if we have, I don't know, what is this, 40 data values? You know, maybe a good, a good number of classes would be seven or, or six. But usually, they'll tell us how many classes they want. Um, in this one, they would have said, we want six classes. And then we're going to figure out what the lower class limits and the upper class limits are of each uh, of each of the classes of the table. So if your data are rounded to the nearest hundredth like these, then your class should be also, your class limit should also be rounded to the nearest hundredth. You wanna make sure that you capture all the data values. So if you're, um, for example, if we had a if we had a data value that was 13.95, where would it go? It can't fit in the first class because 13.95 is larger than 13.9. It can't fit in the next class because 13.95 is less than 14. So the way we get around that is we just create our limits here so that we these numbers are different, but if we had this data here where everything was rounded to the nearest hundredth, then we would just tack on another nine, 10 to 13.99. So then 13.95 would have a home in this first class. And then this, ne then this next class, we would round this upper class limit and just tack on another nine. Then everything would have, we didn't have to do it here because probably all the data values were rounded to the nearest 10th. But if you have data rounded to the nearest hundredth, you have to make sure that, auto, that each data value has a home. Usually, when we establish the, the lower class limit of the first class, we just use the minimum data value. Uh, this author says, well, you can use the minimum data value or you can use something, a nice number that might be a little bit lower. So we're going to identify the min and we're going to identify the max. Then we're going to take the maximum data value and subtract the minimum data value. So if you take the max and the min, you get this range of, of values in here. And then we're gonna chop them up into the number of classes we want. So if we want eight classes, we would take that range of max to min and we would divide it by eight and that would make eight, eight equal bars, eight equal classes if we divide by eight and they'll all be the same. And we'll call that the class width. But whatever number we get here, whatever this is, we're gonna round up. Turns out if we don't round up, then the largest data value might not have a home. So in this problem right here, the smallest data value is 8.28, and the largest data value is 19.43. You can see them in there. Here's the, here's the smallest one, and the largest one is right next to it. All right, so we're going to calculate the max minus the min and divide by the number of, of classes that we're interested in. So let's say we want 12 classes. We want 12 bars in our histogram. This last example that we had, 
they insisted on 10 classes. So we have 10 bars. This one, let's say that we want 12. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take 19.43 and subtract 8.28, and then we're gonna divide by 12. And when you do that, you get 11.15. And then if we divide by 12, you get 0.9291, and then a bunch of sixes that repeat. All right, now we wanna round up. And the question is, what do we round up to? All right, we want to make sure that we capture all of these. <clears throat> and so when we establish our classes, we're going to start the first class at the minimum data value. So this is 8.28. And our data values are rounded to the nearest um, hundred. So we want to make sure that this one ends at the nearest hundred. So we're going to round this, this value right here up. Because if we don't round it up, then we might not capture the last, the last data value. Okay, so I'm going to round it up to the place value of these data values to the nearest hundredth. And the nearest hundredth is right here. So I want to round up to that place value there. So I peek at uh, this is two and some change. So I'm going to round this up to 0.93. Okay, so once we know that the class width is 0.93 and each one of our bars is 0.93, then we can create the rest of the classes. <clears throat> now I know that from what we've done up here, that if you want the class width, you have to subtract two consecutive lower class limits. So when I subtract the 8.28 with the next lower class limit, I have to get 0.93. So if I reverse that, then I would just add 0.93 to the 8.28 here. So adding 0.93, I'd get 9.21. And if I add it again, 10.14. And if I add it again, 11.07. I'm just continuing to add using this formula. I type in my first number and then say add 0.93. And then every time I enter, hit enter again, it's going to recall this last thing. It's going to take my last answer and add 0.93. This is how you can, you can generate this lower class limits pretty quickly. Unfortunately, we need 12 of them. So I have to hit enter many more times. So we've got 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12.00, 12.93, 12.14, 12.15, 12.16, 14.79, 15.72, 16.65, and I think I have one more, 18.51. Now you don't see them all, but they're all there. All right now to get the upper class limit, just peek at the lower class limit, or the, uh, the lower class limit of the next class. So if this one ended at 921, or this one begins at 921, then this one must end at 920 because we want to make sure that this is one one hundredth away from where the next one begins, because all of our data values are rounded to the nearest hundredth. It takes 0.93 to get to the, the next uh, lower class. So if we just add 0.92, that's another way to do it. But this is going to be 10.13 because the next one begins at 10.14. This is going to be 11.06 because the next one begins at 11.07. The ending of this class is 11.99 because the next one begins at 12.00 and so on. And you can continue to just go right down the list, peeking ahead at the next lower class limit, and that can help you establish the upper class limit of the previous class. And the last one would be 19.43. Now, if you'll notice, our largest data value, we've already identified it up here, to be 19.43. Notice that it fits in the very last class. We're going to count it in the 12th class down here. Had we not rounded up, if we rounded down, for example, then our class width would be 92. And we would end this num this lower, this upper class limit of the last class at a much lower number. It'd be something like 19.31 you know, or something. And we wouldn't capture our largest value. OK, uh, I just wanted to give you a sense of how and we're going to practice this on many other problems coming up. You're going to have a set of data, and you'll be asked to identify the, the classes 
uh, class with and so on. All right, now one more thing before we get into the histogram. Uh, there's another column that we sometimes use in a, in, a, in a histogram and that's known as the relative frequency. So I'm gonna add another column to this table here. Now, in order to calculate the relative frequency, the relative frequency is like a, a proportion and it's uh, a rate that enables, if we convert the rate, uh, we can convert the rate to a percentage. So we can ask questions like, you know, what percentage of the outcomes fall at, at this particular class? And so <clears throat> we need the relative frequency, which is gonna be a decimal. It's like a probability, a number between zero and one. In order to get it, we have to know the total frequency. So let's just quickly add these up. Let's see, 27, 36, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. All right, so there's 50, and I guess they, they told us that they were gonna repeat this experiment 50 times. All right, so what fraction of all 50 of these would fall in the first class? Well, what we would do is we can see that the frequency is 16. So what fraction of all the 50 would be in the first class? You just take the frequency and divide it by the total and do that for every class. And what you end up with is this thing we call the relative frequency. Now, when you do the decimal here, if you just divide this out, you get 0 0.32. Decimals are always a little more useful when we're using relative frequencies because decimals are easy to convert to percents. So what we would say here then is that 32% of the time there, well, this would mean that they missed the first free throw. They shot one and they missed. So the, they shoot until they miss. So made the first one, missed the second one, made the first two, missed the third one, made the first three, missed the fourth one, made the first nine, and then missed the 10th one. But they just kept doing this. The more they make in a row, they continue to shoot until they miss one. So number of free throws until a miss, 10, I think is what that means. Okay, so each one of these, you take 11 divided by 50 and you get 0 0.22, 22%. Nine divided by 50 and you get 0 0.18, 18% and so on. Seven divided by 50, uh, 0.14% or 0 0.14, which is 14%. And then you get into these smaller numbers. It's 4%, three divided by 50, that's 6%. And then you've got 0%, and then 1 out of 50 is 2%. Now, you should find that when you add all these numbers up, you're going to get 50 over 50 or 1. The sum of the relative frequencies always add up to 1. <clears throat> so that's what I wanted to do for this one. Sometimes in a histogram, the vertical axis is going to be relative frequency. Other times, it's going to be frequency. So we need both of these. All right, so what we've done is uh, part A, where it says construct a relative frequency distribution. What this involves is just adding on another column of the already existing table that gives us the relative frequency. All right, now we're going to use these numbers, convert them to percentages, and then answer these questions in B, C, and D. So B says, what percentage of the time did she first miss on her fourth free throw. So here's the fourth, and that corresponds to the fourth. What percentage of the time did she first miss on her fourth free throw? We go over. This is the frequency that happens seven out of 50 times, or 14%. So we take the decimal version of the relative frequency and convert it to a percent by moving the decimal place two places to the right. <clears throat> Okay, uh, go ahead and write into the chat uh, the answer to C, which says, what percentage of the time did she first miss the 10th free throw? What percentage of the time? Okay, I agree, 2%. Uh, if it said, what is the relative frequency of the 10th free throw, then we would say 0.02, but they specifically said percentage, and so we wanna convert the 0.02, is it 0.02? 10th free, yeah, 0.02 here to a percentage. All right, this one's a little tougher, D. It says, what percentage of the time did she make at least five in a row? At least five in a row. What do you think? 
can add these in your head. This one takes a little bit of interpreting the, the data. Wow, 86. Not sure about 86. Okay. So uh, let me do this with X's and O's. <laughs> uh, first free throw missed. That's an X. Um, number of free throws until a miss. So made the first one, missed the second. Here, made the first two and then missed. Number of free throws until a miss. So they missed on the third one. Uh, this one would be make, 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 and then miss. So when four free throws are attempted, that means the first three were made and the fourth one was missed. So this one down here, these folks made, 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 and then missed. Shot a total of 10 free throws, made nine in a row, and then missed the 10th one. Okay, yeah, so this says, I'm gonna go check the categories where this is true. The percentage of the time she made at least five three free throws. So at least five three free throws begins here with six. Made five and then missed the sixth one. Seven, it would be make six and then miss the seventh and so on. Beginning here for five, the person made four and then missed on the fifth one. So there were not five free throws made here. The five free, free throws were made beginning with six attempts. So everything for six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 would represent made at least five. So that means you have to add these percentages. So I see a couple of 10% in there and that's correct. Yeah, so if you interpret this as at most, then you're gonna be looking at adding up a bunch of these percentages down here in the lower classes. Okay, but the important thing on this one was the uh, calculation of the relative frequency that's gonna be uh, important. All right, now we're gonna get into the graphs. Um, there's a couple of things in the back uh, that I'm just going to take you through, but just so you know that um, there is a step, set of steps that will walk you through constructing a histogram with your calculator. Here it is. And um, you're going to go into that Y equals key above it says stat plot. You've already had some experience with this because you're, you've, you've constructed the scatter plot. You're going to go to that same menu, stat plot, and you're going to set up a plot. But the icon you want is the one that looks like the bar graph. And then you want to dump all your data into X, the X list L1. And my calculator doesn't give me the option for colors. But, but I just want you to know that this is available. Uh, so if you want to construct a histogram with your calculator, you can do it. Okay, let's start off with this one. As of 2011, let's see, who was president in 2011? That would have been Barack Obama, right? 2008 to 2016, 2008 to 2016. So Barack Obama was 47 when he was elected. And then he was 50, one when he began his next presidency, but we're not going to count that one. And then Donald Trump was 68. I think he's 72 now. So when he was elected, he was 68. And now I think Joe Biden is going to be elected and he's like 74. He's going to be the oldest president. But here are data. Okay, we're going to go through the entire problem here and uh, we're going to create this grouped frequency distribution. And then maybe we'll go right ahead and, and, and draw the histogram as well. So the histogram comes directly from the frequency distribution. So look through the list and tell me the min and what is the max. We know now we'd have a new max for Joe Biden, but before that, was it 69? Is that the largest? I think that would be Ronald Reagan. He was pretty old. And I think these are in order. So George Washington was 57, John Adams, 61. Thomas Jefferson, 57. I probably have these in the wrong order, but uh, Hamilton was in there, right? Hamilton, we've studied him a few times. He shows up again, but only his age at inauguration. Anything larger than 69? What's the smallest? I think the youngest president was John F. Kennedy, 42. Well, I'm just interested to see how they count these because some presidents get two terms, right? And they get, they get an inauguration at each term. So do we count that twice? 
and we're going to call Trump is 45, right? And so Biden is 46, 45. So there's 45 here. So this 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 last one here must be Obama, and we don't give Obama the title 44 and 45. We just call him 45. There's only one president. I think it was Grover Cleveland that we gave him two numbers because he was elected. And then he tried again, he was not elected. And then he tried again, and he was elected. So he got two numbers. He might be, you know, 20 and 22 or something like that. All right, is it 42? All right, so let's determine the class width. Okay, I'm gonna ignore this, 45, 10. Let's say we want nine classes. So 45 data values divided by nine, that would then average about five data values in each class. Okay, so here's the calculation of the class width. All right, it's approximately equal to, and this is before the rounding, we're going to take the max minus the min and then divide by the number of classes. So we've already identified those numbers. So we're going to take 69, subtract 42, and then divide by 9. And this is approximately 27 divided by, so I think 3 will work here. All right, I wanted to, I didn't think I was going to get a, a perfect decimal there, so let me just increase this to 10. I wanted to show you the rounding piece. So if we have 10 classes and we take max minus min divided by 10, we get 2.7. Now this number, we're always gonna round up. And we're gonna round up to the place value of our data values. And all of these data values are whole numbers. So we're gonna round up to the nearest whole number. And the whole number there is two. And uh, we round up, we have two and some change. So we're gonna round up to three. We would round up to three even if this was 2.1 or 2.0. We're not rounding mathematically here, we're rounding up. Okay, so now we know the class width is three. So we're gonna start at the min, which is 42, age at inauguration, and then we're gonna have the frequency. And you know maybe we'll go ahead and calculate the relative frequency as well. All right, we're gonna start with the min. There's no need to start at zero because none of the presidents were zero to 41 years old. So we might as well just start at the minimum. And now we have the class width is three. And we're going to continue to add three going down our classes until we get 10 classes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten 10 classes corresponds to 10 rows of our table. Maybe I'll number them over here. 10 classes. We're going to take the class width, which is 3, and we're going to add it to 42. 42 plus 3, 45. 45 begins the be, er, becomes the beginning of the next class. Then we're going to add another 3, 48, and another 3, and another 3, and so on all the way down. So it looks like then. Since the class width is three, we should have three whole numbers in each class. So 45, 42, 43, 44, three numbers. This one ends at 44, good thing, because the next one begins at 45. So you can see that you're just adding two to the lower limit to get the upper limit. And so the rest of these would be as follows. All right, so that's the setup. Now to construct a histogram, now to do these frequencies, I'm gonna show you a quick way to do it. I'm gonna show you a way with the uh, graphing calculator, but unfortunately it requires that we type in all the data. Uh, but that's good because um, we'll be able to sort the data and so on. So take a couple minutes and enter in all of these data values. Let me Zoom in a little bit. I think you can see them all there. Uh, remember, if you want to save that list, you can go and copy it. I don't need it. And so I'm going to clear it out. And when we're done, we're going to have 45 different data values sitting in L1. All right, so you can type them in in any order. Uh, we can sort them if you want. All right, so now we're going to go through the steps to construct the histogram. The, the histogram is not, you know, the, the fact that the calculator can do it is not the interesting part. But what the interesting part is, is that one, once we create the histogram, we'll be able to fill in all of these numbers in here quickly. So that, that's the benefit. 
All right, if, even if you sorted them, it would take you a while to go through the list and count the number of data values between 42 and 44. Okay, so here's how you do it. We're gonna go in, up to the stat plot. So second, and then Y equals. You should be familiar with this screen. This is where we set up the scatter plot. Let's go ahead and select number one, just hit enter here. Make sure the plot is turned on. Now, when you come down to the type of graph, you wanna go over to the one, and I know my screen doesn't look perfectly like yours, but you wanna to go to the one that has the, the thing that looks like a bar graph. And you can't just hover over it like I'm doing right now. You have to physically hit the enter. So hit enter and then down. And it's always gonna ask you for the list where you entered all your data. So for me, it's L1. You put your data in L1 too, you'd say L1 here. Each data value occurs with frequency one. So now we've turned on the plot. There's one other thing we have to do for a histogram. The histogram will be a bar graph. Uh, over here will be the, the vertical scale will be the frequency. So we need these numbers. And the horizontal scale will be the, will be the age at inauguration. So if we don't start at zero, what we typically, typically do is just put this little marker here that indicates that you know, this is not the real y-axis. There's a break. We're not starting at zero. We're going to start at 42. 42 is our first class. And then our next class begins at 45. And then we're going to write all the other ones. 45, add 3, 48, add 3, 51, and so on. So we're going to go all the way out to age 72. And we're going to have bars here. All right. So you now need to go into the window, that's right here, the window, and you have to manually set the dimensions of the viewing rectangle so that the calculator knows how you want to set up your, your histogram. So you have X min, this is going to be equal to the min. In this case, it is 42. So we're going to establish the minimum data value to be X min. Then you're gonna have X max and X scale, then Y min, Y max, and then Y scale. And I think there might be something down here about resolution. You can just leave that to be one. The max would be the lower limit of the next class. And I'm just gonna say not in the, the table. By, what, by that, I mean, you know, we, we basically have to go from 42 to 72 jumping by threes. Now 72 is not in our table, but it would be the lower the lower limit of the next class that's not in our table. That's what I mean. So you want to make sure that all of these have the same width. So we don't want to go up to this last class and say 69 to 71 because this is 71. We want to continue on the trend to continue to add three. So in this case it's going to be 72. Okay, the X scale is important. This is the class width. And in our case, the class width is three. That's one you wanna get right. All right, so for the Y min, I always put negative one and the only, this is frequencies, right? So that's all these numbers in this column and they're all positive whole numbers, but I always put negative one so I can see the horizontal axis. And if you just start at zero, the horizontal axis will sit at the bottom of your viewing window and you might not recognize it. Uh, the Y max, you know, just set some larger number. We've got 40 data values, so maybe the highest bar will be 20. If it's not 20, we can go back and change it. And then the X scale, maybe we'll jump by twos. All right, so we're almost there. Oh boy, I didn't want to do that. Okay, so now we're going to go to the window and we're going to change to these numbers. 42 to 72 on a width of three, negative one, 20, and two. X res. Um, so we have our plot turned on again, if you hit the Y equals key, and we don't have any other equations in here that we're graphing. So we're ready to go. We've got the data in, we've got the plot turned on, and we've got our window set up to match our histogram, the one we want. Last thing, hit the graph key, and there's the histogram. But here's the beauty, this key trace, go ahead and press trace. And what it does is it traces on each bar. So if you, if you hit trace, 
we're on this first bar here, this, the, the lower class limit is 42 and the upper class limit is less than 45, so 44. And then here it gives the frequency. So the frequency of the first class is two. And if you use your arrow keys and scroll to the right, you get the class from uh, that begins 45, it has a frequency of four. And you can get all these frequencies without having to manually go through your list or through the data set to count up these frequencies. Five, six, 12, five, and another five, and then three, and one, and another one. And these add up to 44. Now the highest bar that we had here was 12. So I could go back to the window and have my Y max be 13. That would elevate all the bars because we're changing the dimensions. So it makes it look a little bigger, but it's not gonna change the frequencies, of course. So there it is, here's the, here's the histogram. And so um, generally you're gonna, you're gonna sketch it by, by hand. And these are gonna go from zero all the way up to 12. So if we could put a little scale on here and that would tell us how high we want, we need to go up. So for the lowest bar, we go up to two and then up to four and then up to five and then up to six. All right, my scale's a little bit off and that's why the bars look non-uniform. The next one goes all the way up to 12 and then a couple of fives and then a three and then a one and then another one by hand or by calculator. They should look pretty, pretty close. And I say that you'll save time by entering all this data values in and constructing the histogram to get the frequencies. All right, the relative frequencies then, um, we take the frequency and divide by the total, the frequency and divide by the total. So um, again, you're gonna be doing some tedious calculations, the same thing over and over and over again. And it looks like we divided every single frequency by, by 44. So now, so let me show you another trick of the calculator. It's not really a trick, but it's a function of the calculator. Um, if you go into your stat and uh, edit, I'm gonna save that list just so I have it. And I'm gonna clear out two lists. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna type in these numbers and then in one command, I'm gonna divide them all by 44 to get this column. So two, four, five, six, 12, Five, five, three, one, one. Oops, because I put them in L2. All right, so you can see in L1, I have all of the, the frequencies. Okay, I had to divide all those numbers by the total of 44. So instead of doing them one at a time on the home screen, I'm going to do, use a formula. So I'm gonna highlight L2 and I'm gonna enter a formula. And the formula I'm gonna enter is, I'm gonna take the number in L1 and divide it by 44. All right, so with the L2 highlighted down here, I'm gonna hit second and then the number one. So that's gonna take the number in, in, in L1 and then I'm gonna divide it by 44 because I wanna divide all these numbers by 44. And if I do it this way, it's gonna do them all at once. You can see the decimal here. So you can do it manually or you can use the technology to, to help you do it. Uh, 045, I'm just going to round these to three decimal places, 091, 114, 136, 273, uh, the fives are 0.114, and then scrolling down further, 0 0.068, 0 0.023, and another 0 0.023. Now because we've rounded these numbers, when you add them all together, you might have some rounding errors. So um, theoretically, those numbers should all add up to one, but you might get something like 0.999, or you might get something like 1.001. There might be some rounding error. That doesn't mean you made a mistake. Okay, we calculate the relative frequency just because in some cases, we want the vertical scale to be the relative frequency instead of the frequency. Because if it's the relative frequency, then we can convert them easily to percentages. So there's your histogram, both the calculator and the, um, you know, kind of by hand version. All right, we can, uh, we'll practice some more in later sections. Uh, one other thing that I need to share with you and, and um, 
we're always going to be interested in what the shape of the distribution looks like. That is, if you could describe the whole histogram and with like one or two words or a, or a phrase. And here are some words that we use. If you have a histogram that looks like this, where all the bars are about the same height, this is what you would get if you've like flipped a coin and your outcomes are one, two, three, four, five, six. And you know, about one sixth of the outcomes would be ones, one sixth of the outcomes would be twos, one sixth of the outcomes would be threes, and so on. But all of the bars would be the same. If you see a distribution like this, then we're going to call it a uniform distribution. So one word will describe what we mean the shape is. Uh, this one here, uh, it's going to be called bell shaped. It's also symmetric. And this one is also symmetric. Symmetric. If you draw a vertical line right in the middle and you rotate the graph around that vertical line, you get the same graph. Same thing here. If you draw a line right around in the middle and you kind of rotate the graph around that axis, you would get the same graph. Rotate it 180 degrees, you end up with the same graph. If that happens, you have a symmetric graph. This one is uh, what we call bell shaped and it looks, if I put a nice curvy shape over it like this, it kind of looks like a, a bell. So that's what they mean by bell shaped. It means high in the middle. And then as you go away from the middle, the bars will taper down to smaller frequencies. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, this one here is called skewed right. All right. Uh, when you have a lot of the data kind of front loaded on the left hand side, and then you just have a few data values off to the extreme far right. We call this the tail of the distribution. And if you could take a curve like this, and you've got the tail of values over here, we describe the skewness in terms of where the tail is located. And since the tail is over here, and this is to the right, we say that this data distribution is skewed right. So my curve doesn't look perfect. But anyway, there's a tail over here. It's certainly not high in the middle and tapering off symmetrically. Similarly, this one has a tail to the left and it's front loaded on the high side. So the tail is over here. So we say that this one is skewed to the left. Your author has lots of other ones, like uh, the mode is the most frequently occurring data value. So if you have a distribution that looks like this, where you have two humps in it, and the two humps don't have to be the same height, we call this bimodal, that is two modes, two high points. And uh, I think your authors even have something like this. This is what COVID looks like it's here right now. But eventually, if we shut down, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come back down. So this would might be trimodal, or I think they just call it multimodal. And a couple of notes here, it's important to know that you don't have a, there's never going to be a data uh, distribution, a histogram that we can draw this nice curve over that will match one of these shapes perfectly. So this is, this is slightly skewed right, and this one is more dramatically skewed left. And so we'll say approximately bell-shaped. And we'll use words like symmetric and so on. Okay, what do you think about this one? Skewed left, skewed right, uniform, bell-shaped, bimodal. Okay, good, skewed right. Okay. It takes more of this shape right here where you have most of the values on the low side and then you've got a, a couple of extreme values off to the right. So if I were to put a shape over here, it would look like this. How about this one? Okay, good, bell-shaped and symmetric. Now what about this one here? You know, kind of high in the middle, low as you taper out. You know, it might be a little bit skewed to the left, but not much. See, they don't, they don't all conform perfectly to one shape. So, you know, I probably would call this one bell-shaped, you know, slightly skewed left. They'll usually always ask you that question. So if they give you a data set, they're gonna to wanna to say, Sketch the histogram and then determine the shape. Um, okay, let me just give you a scenario and then you tell me what the graph looks like. Envision that you went out and you collected data on the question. What about this one here? Number of alcoholic drinks consumed per week. Think about people in your family. If you ask them this question, your friends, your family members, or just randomly calling people on the phone and asking them, 
how many drinks do you consume in a week? And then you write down all their responses. What do you think the graph would look like? Bell-shaped? Uniform? Skewed right? Skewed left? All right, number of alcoholic drinks consumed per week. All right, so maybe for me, it might be two. All right. Um, my brother, John, it's more like 42. For friends that I have, maybe it's one drink. I, but I have a lot of friends that family members that maybe don't drink at all. So I'm going to see a bunch of zeros or one or two or three. There are going to be people like um, Uncle John who do consume a lot. But those individuals are going to be rare. So when you were to, if you were to graph this data and you went from zero to 42, you would have just a couple of values down here on the large side. Most everybody would be kind of down here on the, you know, your friend group may be different, but probably as you go along this scale, you're going to have most everybody consuming fewer number of drinks, but there are a few people that drink a lot. So I would say this one would probably look skewed right. So this is a little diff more difficult because you have to kind of envision how a lot of people would respond. 